Okay, so uh, this is the first inaugural uh, fashion at Google talk, and I'd like to introduce to you Sheena Mathaken. She did a pretty unique, interesting project that became very popular, and she's going to tell us all about it today. And uh, yeah, hold down the applause, it's all right. She's <laughs> okay, here she is, Sheena Mathaken. So, I want to tell you a little story about a little black dress and where it all started and how it started. And not unlike a lot of creative endeavors, uh, this project, uh, dubbed the Uniform Project, also started in a, in a place of um, dissatisfaction, uh, deep-seated dissatisfaction, mainly from uh, being in a career that you're unhappy with, that has let, ooh, sorry, I have something on my screen. Sorry. Um, mainly uh, dissatisfaction with a lot of things. Um, a certain apathy, uh, creative stagnation. I worked in advertising for a long time, and I had sort of hit a point of complete st uh, creative um, death, as you call it, um, and wanted to sort of step out of that and do something different, and also something a little bit more consequential. Um, but didn't really know how to go about it. Um, so started thinking about this and, and tried to figure out what, what, what am I really learning from the industry I was in. And what, probably one of the best lessons I learned, which was very well captured by Hugh McLeod, was that if you, well, as you can see, if you talk to people the way advertising talk to people, you will get punched in the face. So. Um, what do you do with the skill sets I had, and how could I turn it around and stop manipulating people into buying things that they didn't want or didn't need, uh, and instead use it for something a little bit more meaningful for me? <clears throat> and that's where it began. So I started looking at um, the whole notion of charity, which I found really problematic because um, there was something wrong with the, with the models of philanthropy. I felt that it was it was a very paternalistic, patronizing approach to uh, to the notion of giving, uh, which Oscar Wilde actually uh, speaks about it very eloquently. It is much easier to have sympathy with suffering than it is to have sim sympathy with thought, and this really struck a chord because it was it really. I found it really, really relevant in today's context because now we're, we're at a time where, uh, because of the web, everyone's a lot more aware of social issues and there's definitely this groundswell of wanting to do something about it and people sort of coming together and there's, there's a lot of trends happening in digital philanthropy and there's you know what we call the collectivism culture, which sort of in itself is problematic because it is, um, it had, it had sort of replaced an easy way to like sort of absolve yourself, you know, by oh, okay, I'll make a quick donation here, a quick donation there, it's all done, and it was, it didn't really get to the root of the problem. So, it, which was that, it was impersonal. Like there was no real connection to what you were giving to or where it was going. None of that really existed. So, this whole model of giving that I found really problematic because, it was. Again, this top down, you know, one the the privileged giving to the underprivileged, um, and it didn't it it just doesn't seem right in this day and age because we were so much more connected today, and and there is no us and them. It's more more us, a lot of us. So it was more about creating a sharing model where the grounds were the it was an even playing ground, and it was more of whatever it is, whether it was an idea, it was, it was a concept, it was a cause, it was a philosophy, it was more about sharing it than sort of dictating it or handing it down. And so these were the ideas I had floating around in my head. Um, obviously not as well articulated, this is in hindsight, you know, looking back and kind of making sense of where it all came from. Um, so then I started thinking about, okay, how do I do this? But the, the main issue I had with charity also was that it was so serious, you know? Everyone approached it and there was, it was somber, you know? There was weight to it, you know, that you were doing something good. And did it have to be that way, you know? Why couldn't it be fun? Why couldn't it be just something people would get excited about? And, and, and that's where I, I started thinking about a medium that I found fun, which was fashion. Um, but 
you start thinking about fashion and you realize, okay, this is a hugely problematic uh, field, um, a huge, hugely problematic industry. Um, and I'm taking a quote slightly out of context, but it still really applies. Marshall Duchamp said, living is more of a question of what one spends than what one makes. And we have become, it, it, it's so true because we are today a culture that is defined by what we consume, not by what we create. So uh, fashion, by definition, is, is a toxic industry, uh, a very, probably the most toxic uh, in terms of the landfill it creates and the overconsumption. But I was really more interested in fashion from one of its core values, which was really about self-expression. And um, I do think that there is, it is probably the most, uh, most approachable, most accessible, and radically democratic form of self-expression, fashion, which is accessible to anybody. Everyone does it. It's part of your daily routine. So that's where it struck a chord. I'm like, OK, I'm going to use a daily routine. You know, Take this act of dressing up every day and do something fun with it. Um, and that's sort of how it all started. So I decided to give myself a creative challenge. And I said, all right, I'm going to challenge myself to wear the same little black dress every day for 365 days. And I would reinvent it every day, uh, make it look different, without buying anything new. So I was only allowed to accessorize with um, found things, pre-owned, donated, thrifted, vintage, uh, all those categories. These were all predefined. And I designed the whole challenge to become a fundraiser um, for a foundation called the Akanksha Foundation, which is based in India. And they, they support education for underprivileged children in India. And this is a foundation I knew about through a friend of mine. And they have an, an incredibly progressive education model. They, they prove to the government that it is not a money issue, necessarily. They spend the exact amount that the Indian government spends on a, in a public school on a child. And they use the same amount of money to, to create a completely different education model to show that you know, it's really the challenges of education isn't just a money issue. It's about the methods you teach, and it's a, it's a question of resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so they've, they've proven uh, to be incredibly successful in 20 years and, uh, and now have developed their own curriculum or building their own schools. So it's a, it's a great, progressive, wonderfully enabling initiative, uh, which is why I chose uh, to support Akanksha. So that was, the, that was the setup. And then I started uh, in May 2009 was the beginning of the project. And we made a little movie that sort of sums it up. So I'm, I'm just going to play it, and then we can, we can take it from there.
It, it was all set up pretty straightforward. Um, we designed a website. Uh, I would post pictures every day of, of the dailies. And you could, you could donate through PayPal directly to the cause. You could comment. We created all these fun tags to, uh, to comment. You could tag them batty, brave, cute, ugly, try harder, or make up your own tags, which became incredibly popular with the community of followers because people got very excited about coming up with their own sort of pop culture references and you know <laughs> things very interesting things in ways sorry excuse me to define the outfit so it was, it was actually really fun um, and 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 all all I did really was to start uh, blogging about it and tweeted it every day Facebooked it every day friends picked it up soon blogs picked it up and it completely became viral and people started writing about it, and then the press picked it up. And we didn't do any PR or anything. It was it was just purely viral, purely through bloggers who found it interesting, and and that's how it picked up. And before, by the end of the project, um, we had raised over a hundred thousand uh, dollars for Akanksha, which put about over three hundred kids in school. And uh, the other uh, part of this whole exercise was the dress itself, which. Um, there was huge demand by the end of this. In the course of the project, people kept asking us, excuse me, um, are you going to make the dress? Are you going to produce the dress? So there was a lot of, um, it was a very interesting uh, dilemma for me because the whole purpose of this project was to, uh, one side of it was to sort of make a statement about overconsumption. And, you know, so to be faced with this new sort of demand for a, a product that we had created inadvertently um, was interesting. And so um, through the course of the project, a few, few people had come together to help me, and we had sort of really become the team, the Uniform Project team. And we really started thinking about what does that mean? You know, like, uh, do we produce? Do we actually produce a product and put this out? And we put a lot of thought into it, and we re recognized that it was it was a very meaningful thing to do to actually create a limited edition um, set of dresses, which we produced, and we put it out, and a portion of it also went to the fundraiser. So it helped us raise more money, and it sold out really, really quickly. Um, and we also got. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of accessory donations from all over the world, which initially um, I had put up this link almost as a joke uh, as part of the site on top of, uh, you'll see there's a little donate accessories button, which was really to encourage my friends to give me shit to wear. Oops, I just cursed. Uh, 
Um, so, um, because I knew I couldn't get through the whole year with just stuff in my wardrobe. So, uh, but it turned out that, you know, I was speaking to a lot more people than just my friends. And, and um, my inbox was bombarded with people wanting to send uh, us stuff to wear, for me to wear. So, we had to go through and pick a lot of stuff out and carefully curate it. So, because the whole purpose of this was not to accumulate more stuff. You know, so what we did at the end of the year was auction off all those donated accessories, and that money went to the foundation as well, which again got snatched up by the community, which was fantastic, um, and you know got over two million hits over the course of the first year, and now we have a, a great following online that continues <clears throat> to follow us. So um, by May 2010, last year, which is when I finished the project. Um, you know, this was the big gaping question. What do you do now? What do, you, what do I do with this? You know, we, we had inadvertently created this sort of a movement almost, but a brand that people sort of associated with. We had made product. So there was potential for this to become a business, but we didn't want to really lose the integrity of what, why this was successful. And we were really trying to put a lot of rigor into thinking about what, what, what we were as a brand and what it meant. And, like, and I'd be really uh, wary to stand here and tell you, you know, the recipe for success and why this worked, because I don't think we really know 100%. I think the minute you figure it out, you kind of lose the fun of it, you know? And I think, but there are, uh, to quote Idris Muti, who is uh, the founder of uh, Idea Couture, who is a, is, a, is a pretty incredible uh, expert on branding and branding strategy. He, he says that brand is more than the sum of its parts, and there's, there's so much truth to it in that you can't really, you can, you can identify the components, but when you add it all up, it doesn't necessarily have to work. You know, so there's there's something much bigger than the sum of its parts that go into these things. So for us, it was more about identifying what those things were, but also to identify what are the things that we had most fun with, and why was it fun for people, you know, and what were the values that made it what it was. And so we identified a bunch of things that it was about really, and it, that that made it the values that really made it sticky and fun for people. And, and that's sort of where we started thinking about what do we do next. And you know, I, when I think about the Uniform Project or what it was, and we've asked a lot of people, that these are things that came to us. Like, this is the stuff that our community told us. You know, It's visual, it's viral, it's personal, it's accessible, it's participatory, it's simple, it's social, it's addictive. Um, so from there, we, we decided, you know, let's not reinvent anything. Let's just do what we're doing, you know, and take what I did and ask other people to do it. So why not open it up, open up the platform, have more women do this, because we kept getting requests for people wanting to do it. And But how do you curate it? Because it's not just about anyone being able to do it. How do you still keep it interesting? So we launched our second year early, um, sorry, late last year, as um, called the pilot series, where we have now one woman taking on the challenge for one month, and they pick the cause, and we we work with them in the on on the dress design. It's still the little black dress. the The idea of the black dress is so integral to this whole theme because for us, uh, from a fashion standpoint, it is it is such a iconic fashion staple. It is it is at the center of most a lot of women in their wardrobes have a little black dress. It is it is the perfect jumping board to build off of, you know? So that is the idea and it's it and the whole exercise is really about the art of accessorizing and doing it responsibly and smartly and creatively. So this is the challenge. Now we have different women taking on the challenge every month. We release the dresses uh, every month as well. Um, and we have, uh, every month, there's a new face on the site, and uh, it keeps growing. We have a few, we're, we're looking into scaling this even further, and we have a few other things we're working on as well currently. So the real journey for us is really just getting started, and we're, it, it, it's really a, a, an evolution, and it, it's an exploration right now of where we could go, and that's really the most exciting part that's come out of this for me personally is that it has actually led me here to, to be able to leave 
what I used to do before. I, I quit my job, and now I'm doing this full-time, which is amazing. And I have this incredible team that's come together, and we've formed a business, and you know, it's got a really strong social component to it. We're really strong on our philosophy about maintaining that social innovation side, the social responsibility side, and continuing to do something that remains fun at, at, at its core. So that's really where we are. And um, I, again, I'm, I'm quoting Idris Muti again, but th this is just such a great slide that I totally stole it from one of his presentations. Um, it, it's really, you know, the, the most important thing is those three dots, because um, a story has to evolve, it has to continue, and it has to grow, whether it's a brand or a business or a, or, or a philosophy or an idea, it has to keep growing. So like, that's the most exciting part of all this for us, and that's where we are, and that's it. And here's some information if you'd like to reach out to us. Cool. I don't know, do, do you guys have questions or anything? All oh, right. So the dress, yes, uh, we designed it ourselves. I had the idea. I knew exactly what I wanted. Oh, sure. <laughs> I knew exactly what I wanted. Uh, I wanted. This was sort of based on one of my staple, you know, dresses. So you know what works for you. <clears throat> but I wanted it to be reversible. So it's actually reversible. I can wear it front to back, and it's a button down, so I can wear it open as a tunic. I can layer it. It has pockets. So you know, it's it's really a pretty classic A-line standard dress, which is now on our site. We have a new iteration of it. We've added a, a detachable collar to it. You know, So I think utility, versatility, simplicity, those are like key elements of all our dresses, which we try to maintain always. Yes? Right. Um, that's a very interesting question. I think um, when I when I started this, I was very very conscious of uh, the the existence of the eco movement. I wouldn't necessarily say I was part of it. I mean, I wasn't really part of the fashion industry at all. So for me, it was a very personal thing. But I was already in the habit of shopping vintage, and you know, uh, I shop at thrift stores and vintage, and, and so it was it was a natural sort of progression of what I was extension of what I was doing. But what what I what I learned through the year was that there was there was this really substantial movement happening, and in the course of the first year, a lot of ethical designers and sustainable designers came to us because they found it really, they, they were excited about what we were doing because there, there's a, the, the people who are at the front lines, the creative folk at the front lines of that movement, there, there was almost a, a dissatisfaction on their end to not be just labeled as eco and, and because th there was a stigma attached to that movement because it was labeled as you know Birkenstocks, granola fashion, which just wasn't inspiring. And which is why mainstream wasn't accepting it as a, as a movement, you know? So I think the more creative ethical designers were really about, you know, keep it creative, keep it inspiring. Because at the at the core of fashion for women is desire. You want you want to walk into a store and see something and see it that it's beautiful and pick it up. You're not going to walk into a s store and go, what's organic here? You know, you're not going to do that. So you still have to inspire. You still have to create beautiful garment. And so personally for us, it was great because we got suddenly got access to the right kind of ethical designers who came to us because they got it. You know, they got that this was about expression. And, it, and we had to sort of uphold that. And the rest is a given. I mean, to me, it should be a given. Like sustainability, uh, as far as production goes um, and ethical practices go, it should be a given. Like you have to be responsible in the way you produce and create things. So um, now we're actually building building something based on that with these designers. We're, we're in the process of creating some a platform for ethical designers, which is in, in the works. So that's, I don't know if that really answers your question. It was, okay. <laughs> Well, um, I, think, I think you have to look at it from two sides. 
I was out to make a point. It's an extreme. Obviously, no one's going to wear the same dress for a whole year. You know, it's it, it's a creative exercise. So there is a certain sort of stretch of the imagination and stretch of your resources happening there. I'm not saying that's what you should do every day. It's not a literal, you know, iteration. So that's the one side. And the other side is, um, I mean, I'm down to my basics again. You know, everything uh, that came into my wardrobe is gone because they were all donated accessories. And to be really honest with you, I don't, I don't have that many clothes. You know, I don't think about it. I actually don't think about dressing up a lot at all. Um, I get up, I, it's like literally, what am I wearing today? And I'm out. And then I think that's how a lot of people are. And that's sort of, but it's not that I don't have fun with it, you know? And it's really like, I, throughout the process in the, in the, in the first year, because I did still have my full-time job, it was very important for me to keep that, that daily routine spontaneous. So I didn't plan ahead, except for the crazy days like Halloween and the Mermaid Parade and things like that when I got crazy. But for the most part, it was, it was deliberately kept spontaneous, excuse me, because that's how most people get ready in the morning, you know? So, and I think there's a lot, there were very often I would get stumped and I would uh, just sort of work with something that I never thought I would use in that way and I would, it would end up working. So I think there's a lot you can stretch with given, given the few accessories that you do have. And I think that's actually a really interesting point because now we're doing it for one month and you can see how you know, the women do it differently where they have limited, they, most of them don't go out and buy a lot of new you know, stuff just for that month. They're kind of working with what's in your wardrobe a lot. So 